But now White Evening Silla Black makes more wishes come true in Surprise Surprise. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Scylla Black. Surprise. Welcome to Surprise Surprise. Now, are you all in a good mood? Yes! <laughs> and who wants to be surprised? Yes! <laughs> oh, you weren't too sure about that, were they? Everybody at home watching. Well, I must tell you, somebody's going to be surprised tonight. Yes. Because I happen to know that there's a certain lady here in tonight's audience, and she's celebrating her 65th birthday. Yes. Surprise, surprise. It's you, Margaret Mundy. Oh, Please. Come and join me, Margaret. Yes, Margaret, isn't this a lovely birthday surprise for it you? It is, very much so. <laughs> and it's all down to your son, your Andrew yes. there. Yes. <laughs> you gobsmacked, <Silla. laughs> Oh, well, it, is it a nice birthday present? It is, it's beautiful. Well, your, your Andrew wrote and told me all about you. Now, it, has it always been your burning ambition to be a dancer? <laughs> Your favourite group used to be the Tiller Girls. Yes. <laughs> and you fancy yourself as being one of the Tillers. Oh, no. <laughs> Surprise, Margaret, you're going to be part of the Tiller group tonight. Oh, yes, yes won't that be good? Marvellous. Now, don't worry about a thing, Chuck, because no. you're going to have a, a rehearsal, quite a long one. You know, well, I mean, you I know. thought I was coming here to see the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're in it. <laughs> you are part of it, and you are going to be a star, I can tell. All the girls from the Tillers are waiting behind those screens. Oh, dear. Just waiting for you, Margaret, to do your rehearsal. Yes. So we're going to get you up in the right togs. How's your legs? Oh. <laughs> oh, bloody, bloody. It's a bit fat. <laughs> oh, don't worry, but don't worry. You can wear trousers if you like, you know. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, anything. Mm -hmm. All we want you to do now is to go off there and get ready, and we shall yes. see you later, Margaret. Mm -hmm. All right. You. Yes. Happy birthday. Thank you very much, Scylla. It's a birthday I should never forget. Ah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Margaret. Well, I can promise our Marg that she won't forget tonight. She won't. <laughs> now, the other week, I received a lovely letter from a Fred Lake in Walthamstow, and he told me all about his lovely wife, Beat. Now, Beat is the treasurer of the Highlands Tenants Association and spends a lot of her time helping the elderly on the estate with parties and organised outings. Now, she's a very cheerful and loving person, which is all the more remarkable because she suffers from rheumatoid arthritis. And every time she goes out, she has to go in a wheelchair. Now, one of Beat's greatest wishes is to go to the Royal Albert Hall and take part in the last night of the proms. But because of her disability, it's a dream that has never come true. So, we decided to take the last night of the prom to her. Well, the first thing we needed was an orchestra. So, we sent our Bob Cowdies off to do some auditioning. Well, Silla, we've had a bit of luck. David Elliott from Latimer's School at Edmonton told us about his school's first orchestra and their lead violinist, Jonathan Hill. Last year, they actually won the National Festival of Music for Youth and even played at the Albert Hall. I can hear in the background, Havanaise by Saint-Saëns. 
Seems such a shame to interrupt them. <laughs> I just going disturbing through here. Isn't that lovely? That's smashing, that, isn't it? What a lovely sound. That's marvellous, that. Jonathan. Jonathan Hill, isn't it? Hello, Jonathan. Let me come round here. Let me come round here. Morning, all. Now, uh... Surprise, surprise, Jonathan. Now, let me tell you, thanks to your musical director there, David Elliott, you and the First Orchestra are going to appear on television. Is that right? Fair enough. <laughs> what do you think of uh, Edward Elgar? Very good. Oh, yes. Oh, well, that's just as well because. Uh, you haven't rehearsed him yet. I oh, would. Well, there's time. Come here, don't move out of shot. <laughs> because you, what we're going to do is play Pomp and Circumstance for a very special lady. Is that all right? So, actually, we're doing it now. I'm sorry. So, if you'd all bring your instruments and follow me, bring your stands as well and the music uh, stuff. So, here we go. Come on. Uh, you lead the way, would you, John? Okay, if you don't mind, come on, please. Thank you. Try and hurry up, please, everybody. Come on. <laughs> Bob found the orchestra, he whizzed over to Walthamstow and surprised Pete. Hello. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? I'm awfully well, me. Yeah. Very well indeed, yes. <laughs> Pete, hello. What do you want? Pete Lego, how are you? Doing? <laughs> how are you? Nice to see you, Pete. Hello. Surprise, surprise. Why? Well, your friend, your friend has told us that you love uh, you know, the, one of those, uh, the mice at the proms and all that last oh, night. Oh, I don't. You do, you I really that. do. Yeah, but I know it's difficult for you to get to the last night of the proms, yeah, isn't it? it is. Well, we have brought the last night of the proms to you, B. Not a million miles away from here, as we speak, an orchestra is tuning up and getting ready and awaiting you. So they can play. Do you feel like a bit of pomp and circumstance? Really? Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, hey, well, you can help me because we've got to blow the balloons up yet, and we've got the Union Jacks up, so we've got we've got a hundred of these to do. So, so if you could, uh, there are lots to do, Pete. Now come on. <laughs> I'm really, really, but the quicker we get these done, the quicker we can get them. All right, there's one. Oh, no. Oh, oh right, I'll do them then. Oh, I have to do the lot. I work. How are you, Pete? I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> We'll be going back to Walthamstow later in the show for our surprise, surprise proms. But right now, it's time to say howdy, partners, to a rootin' tootin' son of a gun from the wild and woolly west of Birmingham. <laughs> yes, it's cowboy Steve Tank Wilkins and his wife, Marie. Howdy, fella. Howdy. Put it there, partner. Oh, I know. I think I'll do it the Red Indian way. How? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's lovely to have you on the show, Tank. Really, it is. I mean, I spoke to you on the phone last week and we talked about lots of things, but I didn't ask you, how long have you been a rootin' tootin' cowboy? About 15 years. 15 years. And I also found out that you were Long John's. Yeah. And I also... Yeah. And I also found out that he never washes them. <laughs> because he says that's what the real cowboys do. Oh, what's that? We have that? a pay exactly for you as well, so... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I... But you'll have to break them in yourself. What <laughs> <laughs> <One> passion killers. <laughs> At least I don't have to say I've got an headache anymore, do I? <laughs> Well, we want you to do a little bit of twirling tonight. So what are you waiting for, cowboy? Get along, boy. Get along. Okay. Can't wait. <laughs> Howdy, folks. My name's Tank. I'd like to show you a few tricks today you've probably never seen before, apart from in the movies. Well, first of all, I'd like to introduce to my girl. It's an 1875 Remington, single action, six shot repeater. I call him Remy. He's my friend. He's in the Wild West. I'd probably be dead without him. <laughs> Now, the first thing I'd like to show you is called the Outlaw Twist. This was done by Clint Eastwood in the film, The Outlaw Josie Wales. This way the sheriff point a gun at him. By the way, that's the sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> he takes the gun out of his holster, places it on the palm of his hand, as so, 
off in the shave the bow gun. As the shave reaches the gun, Clint Eastwood spins the gun round, pulls hammer back, points the barrel, and pulls the trigger, all in a split second, like so. <laughs> and of course, if you're really daring, you can always do it to your wife too. Of course, if you want to be really daring, you can try it with two. <laughs> Another little trick I do is using a bowie knife. This was a, a legend in the West. First trick I'll show you is this one. <laughs> Where, of course, a knife was meant for throwing. The top balloon is the heart of the man, which you throw the knife at, hit the top balloon, that will release the bottom balloon, which will fall to the ground. Before it falls to the ground, I try and pull the gun out and shoot it. It should go something like this. <laughs> you all of you at home especially the kids please don't try any of those tricks that tank does because it's taken them a lot of time to learn them now then let me tell you about Tamika Hopkins Tamika's 10 and she's from Clantrasan in Wales since she was five Tamika has been raising money for charity and last year alone she raised four thousand pounds she managed to reach this figure and help keep Wales tidy by spending most of the year on a sponsored litter collection after school and at weekends, Tamika went out cleaning the streets and parks of Mid Glamorgan. A shining example to us all of how to keep the environment clean and raise some money for others. Her mum, Gwen, was so proud of her that she wrote to me to ask if I'd give Tamika some encouragement and help her with some rubbish collection. So off I went to Clun Crun, yes, to surprise Tamika when she came out of school. Tamika! Tamika Hopkins! Surprise, surprise, Tamika, how are you? Okay, thanks. Is it a surprise that I'm here today? Yeah. Your mum, Gwen, wrote in and told me all about you, Chuck. And she asked me to come down here today to help you. Here, here's Gwen. All right, Gwen. She asked me to come down here today to help you collect some litter. All right. Yeah. Now, I've brought a few litter bugs with me of my own. And in fact, we've got a very environment-friendly rubbish-eating machine. So are you fit, Tamika? Yeah. Well, what are we waiting for, Tamika? Let's go. Come on, Gwen. Come on. <laughs> Here's my contribution to finding a solution to the problems of pollution of the earth. For according to our sources, there are certain world resources that are causing far more problems than the world. Fossil fuels are running out and dirty, and atomic power has got its problems too. May I bring to your attention my astonishing invention, which now I proudly introduce to you. It's a solar-powered practical, combustible, compatible, responsibly Garbologically by rubbish that we used to see piling up in dumps around the place. Old motor cars and aeroplanes and waste that used to block the drains recycled in the minimum of space. 
pies and cans and even plastic bottles. It uses all the rubbish that you found. And we're going to have it customized to industrial and family size. And ecologically, you know, of course, it's sound. It's a solar-powered, practical, compostable, compactable, responsibly recyclable machine. Pollution-free and noisy, it operates efficiently, and it's painted in a lovely shade of green. Its emissions are extremely ozone-friendly, and it eats the floor and carbon like a dream. It's a solar-powered, practical, combustible, compactable, responsibly recyclable machine. It's a solar-powered, practical, combustible, compactable, responsibly recyclable machine. break now but we will be back in a mo to see what our Gordon's got for us on Searchline. We'll be visiting a lighthouse and having our own last night of the prom so see you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. Now I have here in my hand a letter now, this letter means something very important to someone sitting here in our audience tonight. It was posted in a very unusual way in a bottle. <laughs> Dropped off a boat in Bridlington Bay. Yes, Barbara Thackeray, you know all about this letter because you wrote it. Come down and join me and tell me more. Come on, Barbara. Welcome to Surprise, Thank Surprise. You. Sit down there, Barbara. Yes, well, this letter. Now tell me, when did you write this letter? 1955. That's over away, 30 years ago, yes, isn't it? it is. I got 35 years ago, mm -hmm. in fact. It's over that. What did you put in this letter? Shall I give you a quick reminder? Yes. yes. Well, here's what it says. Dear whoever finds this, we are brother and sister Geoffrey and Barbara Burt. Because you were that then, weren't you? Because you were only 13, and your brother was only nine, all right? And this, in the letter you say, this was dropped in Bridlington Bay on the 30th of August, 1955. Then you put your address on it, your home address on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to tell you, did you expect, did you expect to get a reply? I didn't, I didn't, no. No. Well, well, you know, this message in a bottle, mm. in that particular bottle, was bobbing in the sea for four months. <laughs> Till it landed on the shores of a German island, mm. Amrin, and a certain lady picked that bottle out of the sea. Yeah. Felina, Felina Kaiser, yes. and you became well, pen it was friends. Femaline, then. Felina Femaline. Yes. But she's she's Felina Kaiser now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, she is. Cause she got married. Well, you know that because you became pen friends, and you have been pen friends indeed for over 35 yes. years. But she writes to me in German. She does. I know mm. that. I know all about you. In fact, the first letter, this letter she wrote to you, you had to take to the library to have yes, it translated. that's right, yes. And you put so much work into your pen friendship that you actually took up German at night school, is I that did, right? yes. And now you correspond in German. Yes, now that's right. Now you've seen photographs, so you know what, Felina or Felina? I think it's Felina. Felina, Felina. Oh. <laughs> Felina. Well, you converse in German now, mm. and you've seen her on photographs, but you've yes. not really seen it in the flesh. No, I haven't. Well, surprise, surprise, Barbara, you're going to see it tonight for the very first time. Really? Yes, just to catch up on the gossip. Here's your pen friend who you've never met over 35 years, Felina Kaiser and her daughter, Birgit. Come in, Felina. <laughs> This is absolutely wonderful. Yes. Yes. yes, you see, you see, and you're totally Munkahauen, aren't you, Barbara? That's German for gobsmack. <laughs> well, you must have an awful lot to catch up on. 
I'm so pleased for you both. I know we're going to catch up with our Bob Cowdries now. He's somewhere in Surrey, actually. He's hoping to light up somebody's life, so let's beam right over. Thank you, Silla. Donald Wilkins is at this moment rushing down the road here to help his neighbour, Eileen Rainsley, who lives in this house. He thinks she's got a terrible leak in her kitchen. Because he loves water, well, he loves the sea. All the way back to his naval days, he was always fascinated by lighthouses. Well, he's going to see a lot of water around a lighthouse. I've got to hide behind the back of the house to surprise him. Donald! Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, my giddy arm. <laughs> got a isn't it? Yep. How are you? Surprise, surprise. I'm here. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> You'll never guess why I'm here. Having the finest idea. Well, your neighbour, Eileen, yeah. has written and told us all about you. Mm -hmm. And you used to be a postman for many years, is that right? Yeah. And before that, you were in the Navy. Well, I was on a training ship at 13, went to sea when I was 15. During all this time, so you were fascinated oh, yeah. by those things that go wink in the night. Oh, yeah. Lighthouses. Yeah, no lighthouses, yeah. You love them, don't you? Oh, yeah. Well, yep. surprise, surprise, Donald. We're going to take you off away from all this hustle and bustle of oh, city life to, oh, to a, a lovely little lighthouse. <laughs> yeah. And it is nice and quiet because it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's in Guernsey. Oh, Guernsey. And that's where we're going now, oh, yeah. Have a look around this old lighthouse. Oh. And I play with it and look around it. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Yeah. When? Now. Now? Now. Come on, get me on. Now. Come on. Get me on. Come on. I can't go now. You can. I can't, not. Oh, we're going to get you changed. Eh? We're going to get you changed. You're going to get me changed. <laughs> well, that'll be first. <laughs> All right, Donald, we promised you a lighthouse, and here we are. What do you think of it? Oh, my giddy <laughs> Well, you must be Jack Fraley. Correct. Right. I'd like to introduce your protege. That's Donald Wilkins. Mm. All right, Jack. How big is your lighthouse? Oh, it's 110 feet. It's 14 foot in diameter inside. Yeah. And it's 177 steps. 177? Oh. We've just oh. come down them. Let's go back up them. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jack. Yeah. Yeah. No, stick yeah. close to me. I don't want to lose anybody. Right. Okay. <clears throat> One way of going round the bend, isn't it? <laughs> What's that? Ship to shore? Right here? Yes, yeah, sell the radio. Ship uh -huh. to shore. This controls the light? Yeah. The light for the building and also controls the fog signal. Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> the first job today is wash the service room floor, which is this one. Who, me? Yes. Oh, well, they better get on with it. Oh. Not the first time I've done this, are they? <laughs> ah, ha, ha, cup of tea. That's the toilet again. <laughs> Right, okay, Donald, over here. We'll test the fog signal. Yep. Now then, I'm going to push that button there. Yep. On. Turn that to fog signal. Right. And turn this one to alternator rate. Okay. That's Donald. When I was young, Jack, my mother said to me, she said, son, she said, one of these days, she said, you'll see the light. <laughs> right, Donald. Like the light now? There's not as much as you think there is. Okay. All you've got to do now, is the easiest job in the world, is push that button. Right, okay. All done. Welcome the man with his finger on the nation's pulse. Yes, it's Gordon Burns. Thank you. Hello, Gordon. Now, what have you got for us this week? Well, I've got a question for you to start off with. Oh. Can you name that tune? No, I'm 
sorry it doesn't ring a bell with me, Come Gordon. on, the world is waiting. Well, I'm sorry for being so bovine, but I don't know it. No, 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 that's, that's the name of the tune. Oh. The world is waiting for the sunrise. It's the signature tune of the Ronston Aces, which was a band that was formed in the early 1940s. Oh. Just before your time, just. <laughs> Stan Orford from uh, Surrey remembers how, as teenagers, they used to pack him in at the clubs and halls of Kingston, Surrey. Here's the band in full swing in 1942. Stan is the accordionist on the left, and he's the man who's very keen to organise a band reunion. He's looking for pianist Mick Mullins, Jim Bannister on guitar, banjo player Roy Kent, and the second accordionist Peter Neat. Unfortunately, Stan can't remember the drummer's name, but he does remember that the Ronston Aces broke up in 1944 when they all had to go into the army. So if any of the band are watching, please ring us and who knows, there could be a reprise of that catchy signature tune. Well now to a happy band of children. Hopefully this picture will stir some memories. These eight youngsters were all the foster children of Brenda Mailings when she lived in Birmingham in the 1970s. Six of them are brothers and sisters whose surname is Aston. Brenda and her husband Fred gave them the chance to stay together as a family when they took them into their home in Sheldon, Birmingham. And sadly, in 1976, Fred died, and six months later, Brenda had to make the heartbreaking decision to let her extended family go. Brenda still sees the other two children, Derek and Lorraine, but has lost all touch with the Astons. So, if you're watching Carl, Malcolm, Gavin and Sonia, Amanda and Sharon Aston, please call us as Brenda Mailings, your one-time foster mum, is desperate to see you all again. And finally, in this section, a very sad story, but one we hope will have a happy ending. It starts in the early 1920s when a William George Hawkins and his wife Edith were a struggling music hall act. They already had two daughters when Edith gave birth to a son, Harold. Times were so hard that when playing the old playhouse in Hitchin, one-month-old Harold was given to the projectionist and his wife until things got better, but things didn't. And sadly, unknown to Harold, his dad died in 1929. Two years later, at the age of nine, Harold vividly remembers being taken to the bedside of a very ill woman who clasped his hand and had tears pouring down her cheeks. Though he didn't know it, it was his mum. A few days later, this letter arrived at the home of his guardian, and it says, Dear Mr. Burnett, Mum died on Sunday and will be buried on Friday. I will write again, tell little Harold when he's older. The letter, which was dated March the 1st, 1931, was from Harold's sister Marjorie. Now, because of changing circumstances, Harold never heard anything more from Marjorie or his other sisters, whose name he never knew. Now, all this was over 60 years ago, but Harold is praying that he might still be able to find Marjorie Hawkins. He believes she may have lived in Lambeth, but if anyone can help, please, please ring us. Indeed, if uh, you can help with any of tonight's stories, the number is 071 222 8070. And I'll uh, croak and splutter back later, but right now it's crystal clear voice of Scylla. Oh, thanks a lot, Gordon. And I think you have to sound ever so sexy with your croaky voice. Oh, Doesn't he, ladies and gentlemen? I'll try not to get better. <laughs> yes, please. Be as sick as long as you like. <laughs> For a bit of culture, so let's go over to the assembly rooms to see how Bob Beat and the band are getting on. That was absolutely fabulous. A big round of applause. <laughs> Hello, Bob. You all right, Silly? Wasn't that marvellous? Absolutely gorgeous. And Beat, you're sitting there, sweetheart. Beat's here. This is the lovely Beat and her husband, Fred. Our promenader-in-chief is Beat. I know she is. Beat, how are you enjoying yourself this evening? Wonderful, Silla. Thank you very much for everything. It's brought all the atmosphere to you of the proms, has it? Most definitely, yes. The reason for that, Silla, I'll introduce you, if I may, to our two orchestra makers, and they are coming in, David. This is David Elliott and Jonathan King. David's the conductor, and Jonathan, Jonathan Hill, sorry. And Jonathan is the orchestra leader. Hello, David and Jonathan. Hi, Silla. Let's go to the youngest one first. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, Silla. How old are you, sweetheart? 17. Oh, just a baby. <laughs> I, think, I think he's thanking you for that, Silla. Yeah. Jonathan, how, how 
how do you feel tonight being on the telly in front of millions of people? Well, I've never done it before, and uh, I hope it's the... Well, you're just 17, sweetheart. I mean, there's plenty of time yet. <laughs> Well, qu well, quite. Well, after this, you know, <laughs> you can only go up. <laughs> oh, Jonathan, enjoy the rest of the evening. What about David, though? Now, David, the conductor, my goodness me. Would you really like to conduct the last night of the proms? Oh, you bet, sir. Yeah, I'd love to. Maybe uh, with this orchestra, maybe you could arrange it for me. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Lesser things have happened. Mind you, with your looks and personality and talent. <laughs> Sure, the office will come piling in tonight. Well, send, send them on to me, Silla. Oh, I will. And what's next, Bob? Well, I'm glad you asked, Alan, because while, while Jonathan and David make their way back to their positions, we prepare for our grand finale, which is uh, the number one march by Edward Elgar, probably better known as Land of Hope and Glory. Oh. Uh, Silla, why don't you join in? Do you know, I thought you'd never ask, Bob, because we've all got our song sheets here with all oh, the good. words on. We've even got our union jacks as well, and the whole audience are even going to stand up to sing with it as well. Smash it. Okay. I'd like to introduce them, if I may, then. Will you please welcome the Latimer School First Orchestra and Chorus. <laughs> Actually, I'm so excited, I could jump off a doll's house, I could. <laughs> that was absolutely marvellous. Have you really enjoyed yourself, Beat? You look so happy. I really have, Scylla. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful evening, and thank you very much to this wonderful orchestra. Ah, oh, isn't this lovely? I, I endorse much. that thank as you. well, Beat. Thanks a lot, lads, and all well, the children that... We're going to go for an marvelous. encore here, Scylla. We're definitely going for the encore, aren't we? Yeah. So oh, we'll see fantastic. you next week. We will indeed. See you oh, next week, Stella. Bob. Ta-ra, everyone. Ta-ra. And while they carry on chorusing, we'll take a break to get our breath back.
But we'll be back soon for some high kicks from the Tiller Girls, another search line from Gordon, and I'm going to be speaking to a man who's a dab and at getting rid of pets. And oh, we've got an absolutely fantastic surprise for a fella sitting right here in our audience tonight. So see you in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Now, 30 years ago, a troop of young girls were acknowledged as the world's best when it came to the high kicks. They were the fabulous Tiller Girls. Now, two years ago, they reformed, and tonight they're going to do their famous dance routine with our very own Margaret Mundy. So, ladies and gentlemen, here she is, the birthday girl, Margaret Mundy, and the Tiller Girls. Good. I mean, you know, it's very hard to do that. I thought she was terrific, wasn't she, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm dying to know, Margaret, you still want to be a Tiller girl? Well, I don't know after this. <laughs> the main thing is, have you enjoyed I've the experience? I've enjoyed it very much, yes, thank, thank you. Lovely. And yes. what about our fabulous Tiller girls? They're Weren't lovely. they great? Yes, they're thank really Thank you very nice. much, girls. I'm so glad you reformed two years ago. <laughs> God bless you all. Thanks a lot. The Tiller Girls and Mark. Well, now we'll do a quick one two over to our Gordon for another search line. Well, the old leg muscles ache just watching them. Well, we usually start this second section with a personal appeal, and tonight is no different. It's made by John Simpson, who recently told me about his younger half-sister, Anne-Marie McNeil, who he's desperately trying to trace. My uh, stepfather was John McNeil. My mother was Lily Clill. We lived in Prover Mill Road in Glasgow. When I was five, my mum had a daughter, Anne-Marie McNeil. And what happened that you lost contact? My mum and father, stepfather, split up when I was seven. I moved down to Shrubham with my mother to my grandmother's. And my half-sister Anne-Marie stayed with her father in Glasgow. But you've absolutely no idea where in Glasgow they're living, if indeed they're there at all? No, no idea at all where they are. The last address was probably Mill Road. But there's a very special reason why this year, above all other years, you'd like to find Anne-Marie. Yes, it's her 21st birthday this year. And I'd like to celebrate with her. That's on March the 24th? Yes, March the 24th. And also, on that day, if you could get to that birthday celebration, you'd have quite a surprise for her as well. Yes, she has a baby brother who's now 18. And she has no idea that he exists? None whatsoever. So what's your message to her if she's looking there? Please contact us. We would like to see you again. And let's hope she does. Now to the quickies. Calling Jimmy Clements. Do you remember your 21st birthday cake being eaten by ants? <laughs> Bit of an anti-climax, I should think. It, it, it happened... No, really. It happened while you were stationed at RAF Kasparit in Egypt between 1953 and 55. You were staying with Frank Steele at the time, and Frank would love to hear from you again. 
Now this is Georgina Jameson as she was in 1948. Your friend Jean Turner, formerly Jean Grey, remembers you from the days you were ATS telephonists together in Colchester and would love you to start dialing search line now. And finally, Prue Williamson sent us this photograph of her sister Lucy Wilson, who she lost touch with after they were evacuated from the beaches of Calais in 1941. Lucy went on to marry an oil man, but Prue hasn't seen her since. So Lucy Wilson, or indeed any of our missing persons, please ring us here at Searchline on 071 8070 before 10 o'clock tonight, or you can write to Searchline, surprise, surprise, London Weekend Television, South Bank TV Centre, London SE 99 6YW. And if you do, it'll help us keep our Searchline success rate as high as ever. And now from one success story, to another. So. Oh, you old smoothie. <laughs> I will move swiftly on. Because it's now digit dialing time again. Yes, this week I'm phoning Nick Frampton. Now he's the founder member and musical director of a barbershop chorus. Nick also plays the tuba, the French horn, the double bass, the guitar, the ukulele. In fact, he's a proper, right, clever Nick. And I hope he's not rehearsing. It's a ten-digit number, so here we go. Mm. It takes a long time to dial out, doesn't it, these ten digits? Hello. 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 Hello, please, can I speak to Nick Frampton, please? That's me. Hi, Nick. Surprise, surprise. It's still here. Crikey. <laughs> um, are you sure? <laughs> well, the last time I looked, it was me. Yes, it was, Nick. I do get people play jokes on me. Oh, no, this is no joke. This is for real, because I know all about you, Nick. Oh, dear. <laughs> what do you mean, oh, dear? Well, who's been telling tales? Ah, oh, well, that would be telling you, wouldn't it? Actually, I know all of, a lot, a very great deal about your pastime, but I don't know what your job is. What's your proper job? Uh, I'm a, a rat catcher. <laughs> a what catcher? A rat catcher. A rat catcher? Yes. Yeah. Well, oh, how did you get well, into that kind of job? Pest, pest control. Oh, pet the posh... give it its posh name, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but now more to your hobby, or oh, it's more of a hobby, actually. It's your obsession. Because you belong to a barbershop chorus, do you not? That's right, I do, yes. Yes. And how many is in your chorus, Nick? Oh, on a good day, uh, about 20. 20? Mm. On is... a bad day, not quite so many. Oh, really? <laughs> now, where do you play, where do you sing in your barbershop chorus? Oh, we practice in, in Newport, which is sort of in the centre of the island, so uh, everyone can get there easily. Yeah. In, a, in a school. And I know, I know a lot sing, about... We sorry. sing anywhere. You sing anywhere? Whoever asked us to sing, we Well, sing. I am so pleased you said you sing anywhere. Oh. Because we want you to come and sing on Surprise Surprise next <laughs> week. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, but it's a bit of excitement. A bit of excitement? Well, I know, I know you love show business, because we've got one or two photos of you. Oh. Especially when you were the demon in the pantomime. I love the tights. Oh dear, yes, I'm not particularly good in tights. I know. I was probably better then than I am now. Oh really? Yeah, I've put a bit of weight on since then. You, oh, even more so? Even more so. Oh my goodness me, so we're going to look, look forward to a whole lot of more Nick, are we? Oh dear. Oh yes, good value for money, not many of those to the pound, you know. <laughs> They only said that about Dolly Parton. <laughs> there has to be a male equivalent. <laughs> Can you listen to our audience? You're actually on the telly now, oh, Nick. <laughs> and I suppose you're wondering who tell me about you. Yeah, well... Mm. Well, you know, you're called... You're called White Harmony, aren't you? We are indeed. And you know uh, a girls' barbershop chorus by the yeah. name of White Satin? Yes, we do. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, do you know a certain... Lovely ladies they are too. Sorry? Lovely ladies they are too. And what about lovely Carol? Do you remember her? Yeah, well, Carol. Carol. <laughs> <laughs> you 
don't worry, she's married and everything. She's got children. Uh, but well, Carol said you would, you would never if you saw her, but she, you really wouldn't recognise uh, her name. Well, I, I have that trouble with women, you know. I, I know... So <laughs> oh, Nick, tell me more. What trouble do you have with women? Well, I know so many, it's difficult to remember their names. <laughs> Well, Nick Cowell very kindly wrote and told me all about you, and she said that your barbershop chorus is absolutely wonderful, and that's why I want you on the show next week. Will you come? Oh, well, yes. I will, even if none of the others will. Oh, <laughs> oh please bring the other 20 on, won't you? I'll do my very best. I'm sure they'll jump at the chance. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I'll see you next week, then. Fabulous. I look forward to it, yeah. All right, Nick. Ta-ra, then. Oh, bye-bye. Bye-bye, then. Oh, Ta-ra. said not so long ago that we've got a super surprise for a lovely fella sitting right here in our audience, didn't I? Hello. Hey. You look ever so worried. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> You're not? No. Well, it's a good job because I did say a fella, didn't I? <laughs> yes. Well, it's not you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. What's your name? Tony. Tony what? Blake. Tony Blake. Well, Tony Blake, you know... Well, we share a secret. We do share a secret, don't yeah. we? Yes, what's that secret then? Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. It really was for your mate, Tony Elsie, there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not joking. I'm not really interested in you. It's actually okay. you, Tony Blake, I'm interested in. <laughs> yes, come on, please come and join me on the sofa and bring your lovely wife, Lynette, with you. Lynette, come along, please. Comfortable. Well, I, I know an awful lot about you, Tony, because your wife, Lynette, here wrote and told me all about you. Now, take your mind back to 30 years ago when you were serving in Cyprus and you had your firstborn, a little daughter by the name of Dawn. And then your wife, sadly, two years later, your wife and you split up, didn't you? Yeah. And your wife brought Dawn back to England. And then a few months after that, well, well, um, Dawn's mother became very ill and you had to leave the army and you came back to England to look after Dawn, didn't you? Mm. And then the bills started building up and everything, so Dawn had to go and live with her grandparents and you had to go and look for work. Now, I know everybody here at Surprise Surprise know you did your best to keep in touch and everything, but circumstances, no fault of your own, you completely lost touch, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. And how long is it since you've seen your Dawn? About 14 years. About 14 years. Well, surprise, surprise. You're going to see her again tonight. We have found your daughter, Dawn. She's right behind those screens, waiting to give you a big hug. And here she is. Come in, Dawn. Come and say hello to your dad. <laughs> this week.
And I'd like to say a very big thank you to everyone who's taken part in tonight's show. And of course, our very own Gordon Burns and the lovely Bob Carrollgees. So until next week, ta then. ta -ra.